This is my talk, Jira Dreams of Game Design. So it's first and foremost, it is a talk about uh, a greatness. And I should qualify that I, in no way, <laughs> shape, or form, actually qualify to give a talk on greatness. Um, but that doesn't mean that I don't sometimes want to be great, right? Like, I feel like this. I feel like this little pawn that's somehow on this board with all these other people. I've been in the, tomorrow I will have been in the game industry 32 years, which is just, just, I'm so lucky, right, a whole life making games. Thanks for buying games, right? Because that's how I get paid. Um, and, but with that said, so I've known just legends, right? I, I know all the legends in games, just having grown up with them, basically. And I often feel like a little pawn on this board, right? Like I, and sometimes if you catch me on a particularly bad day, I'm gonna say things like, I'm a fraud, I don't even know how I got here, I don't know why people like my games. Um, and I feel like I don't even have a place on the board at all. But like I said, I aspire. I want to be a great game designer. I don't know anybody in this room who says, I just would like to be an average piece of shit. I, like, I don't know anybody who feels that way, and I certainly don't feel that way. I want to try to be good. But in the industry, we have this blessed thing called the triad of constraints. And basically, you will be told that you have to pick two. That you can be fast, you can make a game fast and cheap, you can make a game fast and good, but it's going to cost you a lot of money. And you can do two of these things at any one given time. But what if we said fuck to? And we just wanted to make a great game. Right? What if we wanted to do that? And I call this the triad of greatness. What if I just wanted to try to make a great game? And it costs what it costs, and it takes the time that it takes. Now, there are fortunate people in this industry who have been in that position. They've been able to make a game like that. Um, and it's probably the best place to be. <laughs> and they're not necessarily doing it for fame. <laughs> and they're not doing it for money. This is a recent article here. Um, and I'm just gonna like take a little segue on this article. Like, right now I'm pretty bored with all games, he said. All games. Like, how the fuck is it? <laughs> Olympics, you've had enough, how did anybody have enough of FPL? Like, <laughs> um, and so anyway, I just thought that Zavi's, and I think this is what he really meant, is that he's bored with his games not making all the money. <laughs> <laughs> That's what he really meant. Um, and for me, you know, when I think about making something great, it's for the pure pleasure and delight in doing that. And you all know, because I, I bet everybody in this room has had that moment where they feel like they nailed it. They feel like what they've got in front of them is really as good as they could make. And it might just be an email that you're sending to somebody. It, you know what, maybe it's your hair. Maybe it's not dressed as good as you could be that day, but it feels, it feels good. And it feels good, too, if you've never made something with your hands, to feel the pleasure of that thing that you've built. It is yours entirely. Um, and for me, I'd had a career, right? Like cutting corners and forced decisions and bad decisions and, and compromises because we needed to cut the budget and we needed to cut the time and, and we had an artist quit so we can't make it how you wanted it to be. And this is what my career as this little pawn sometimes felt with. But I always remember the triad of greatness where I said fuck too and I wanted to make something great. So for me, it was time for change. And in 2009, in my kitchen, you know, the game development hotbed of my kitchen. <laughs> I don't cook, so that's what happens in my kitchen. <laughs> so in 2009, I tried to make a game as good as my skill would allow me to. You know, there's, there's a lot of uh, profoundly skilled game designers here. They may have come up with something different, but this is what I came up with. And I wanted to make a game uh, about a difficult subject. This is, this is Train, and it's a game about the Holocaust. Um, and I wanted to see if I could make it as good as it could possibly be. Now in my head, you know, everybody may have different levels, levels of perfection, levels of perfection, quote me on that. Um, everybody may have different levels of perfection. And it, it, it's all depending on your skill, right? So for me, this was as good as I could get. And when I say that, I mean I obsess over every detail. If I picked something up and I knew it had to go into the game, I needed like, why does it need to go into the game? Why do I want to paint a yellow? How high do they need to be? There's gonna be a door where people are putting these people onto the box cars. Well, you know what, I want to make a decision there. There was literally no decision. If you point to anything on train, if you flip that board over and point to things, I will tell you precisely why they are the way they are. Everything was a deliberate design decision. Um, 
And if I didn't know the answer, this is the wonderful part about uh, not having a publisher, producer, or any of the team members. If I didn't know how to do it, I just didn't do it. I waited, and the answer would eventually show up because time is wonderful like that. Um, and my goal, you know, as I said, I made this game in my kitchen, which is not where anybody goes to make a great game. I just wanted to see if I, I just wanted to see if I could do it. I wanted to see if I was capable of it. I wasn't intending to release it. I wasn't intending to talk to anybody about it. Um, but that ended up happening. I talked at a very small conference with maybe, I don't know, 20 people in the room. Uh, but one of those people was a reporter, and he, he was a uh, writer for The Escapist, and he ended up writing an article about it. And so Frank was accidentally released to the world. Uh, so this was uh, still me, obviously. And what's, what's interesting about Train, like I remember the GDC, where it went from, um, uh, oh, you worked on the Wizardry series. Yeah, I remember that, right? Like, which is, you know, a pretty obscure series at this point in time, to, oh, you made Train. And I remember the GDC when that happened, when people knew me not for 20 years of role playing games, but for this single board game that I never intended to show anybody that I made in my kitchen. But between the two games, there were no compromises. I'm trying, there was nothing that I did that was not intentional. Um, and I suspect the fact that it is the game for which I am most respected, um, which is, you know, which is, that sounds profoundly arrogant. This is, these are the words that other people have told me. I think they respect you more for Train than they did for the Wizardry series. Um, I think it's not coincidence, right? That this is a game where I cared as much as I possibly could about game and mechanics and every piece of it. And it's not a coincidence that it's also the one I most respected. Because this is the only corner that matters. So I understand in the real world this this doesn't actually happen, right? That we have these things called publishers, and the publishers uh, <laughs> have they have money and schedules and things that we need to abide by. Um, and, and supposedly, you know, well, we'll get the games that we would love to see. We'll get the, you know whatever's going to be in it, and you know whenever we deliver it. But the reality is, is that we have to deliver games cl as close to on time and on budget as possible. If you're a developer and you don't deliver games on time and on budget, you, you're probably going to eat some percentage of your royalty if you see any royalty at all. And so ultimately, you know, as I go back to fast, cheap, good, um, what people ultimately remember is that you made a not great game, <laughs> right? That's ultimately what's remembered. And nobody, nobody, you know, nobody sends you an email, so you make that piece of shit, right? Like, they, nobody sends you an email and says, like, yeah, well, let me tell you the horror story. The litany of what's happened to make this game. I mean, the reality is, is if you finish a game, I don't care if it's a steaming pile of shit. If you finish a game and your game is, um, it is complete, you have done something amazing. Because people who criticize bad games don't understand what an incredible, creative, profound act it is to actually finish a game at all. Right? Good or bad, just finishing a game is not an easy thing to do. But I would like to be remembered for something more than, than not great. And when I went, you know, after having made Train, I never forgot the feeling uh, that I had when I made it. Uh, so now we're around 2010, still me, and I'm working on Facebook games. Um, and you may have heard this phrase, so MVP, and you think MVP is the most valuable player, uh, but you'd actually be wrong. Um, it is called minimum viable product. Really, this is the term uh, in the Facebook space. And so, you know, pick two, two, and this is this is basically the two they pick, and this is the end result, right? Like, we're not even talking about basically good, right? I don't even know that we're talking about shit, right? We're talking about just, can can we get somebody out there, and hopefully they will pay to beta test. Actually, beta test would be a gift, right? Can they beta alpha test our broken stuff, right? And this was kind of the original <laughs> the Facebook place, and this is how it made me feel, right? Like, you want me to release my game now? My game barely runs. It wasn't, in fact, running this morning, right? <laughs> job anywhere else, right? That's who's coming to work on these games. Um, but it got me asking questions, right? Like, so making games, making any kind of games, and I'm just thinking about these things as this time, you know, how can, how can you make people want greatness? Like, no matter what they're working on, how can you make them want greatness? And if you're a, if you're a lead, right? If you're a lead on your team, often a whole group of people behind you, the herd of people that it takes to put a game together, especially a AAA title, their names aren't the ones that people remember. Like we remember Sid Meier, we remember Will Wright, we remember Peter Molyneux, but those are just three individuals, right? There's herds of artists and designers and coders behind them. Um, and how do you make greatness happen? Uh, and so as I'm pondering these questions, I happen across a piece of asparagus. 
<laughs> well, we'll just one, there's many in this picture. Um, and this is an actual photo. It's not a very good one, but this is an actual photo of this piece of asparagus. Uh, so this piece of asparagus, which you're looking at there, um, every single one of those things was placed individually by a chef, table side in front of me. This piece of asparagus, I'll actually call my husband who said, I hate asparagus. When this thing landed in front of him, I hate asparagus. My husband later raved about a piece of asparagus for two weeks. And it's amazing he wasn't locked up for this because it sounded kind of silly. Um, but every single one of these things is individually placed on there. Uh, and here, in fact, is a, is, a, is a picture of them placing all these individual things. And, and what it felt like to me was this was a chef saying, that piece of asparagus, I'm going to make that as amazing as I can possibly make it. Like actually looking at this piece of food and trying to make it as beautiful and as great as it could possibly be. And where this asparagus happened, this is a restaurant at Meadowood. It is one of two three-star restaurants, uh, three-star Michelin restaurants in the state of California. Uh, this is its chef, Christopher Castal. Um, he holds, uh, he, he got his stars, he's, he's had his three stars since 2011, um, and he's kept them each year since. Uh, and he got his, his third star while he was still in his 30s. Uh, so he's a pretty accomplished chef. He was recently named one of the best chefs in the West as well. These are some more pictures from food uh, that's served at Meadowood. Now, every single thing they grow down on the property, even their plates, are made from clay and the surrounding hills. It's in the Napa Valley. So these are just some more pictures. Um, and, I, and I realized while I was there, like I'm just watching, because you're a designer, you can't help but watch and think of things in abnormal ways and not just enjoy the food like you're supposed to. Um, and I'm realizing that I am currently witnessing a fully designed experience. Now, if you've ever eaten at a Michelin three-star restaurant, you you just, you just have to accept what's gonna happen to your wall. It's a painful experience, right? For one person, it's $225 to eat in, to eat in Meadowood. And it happened, we were going there for a very special occasion. Um, and so, uh, so I realized so that it's a fully designed experience as it must be. Like I'm watching people doing all kinds of things. Um, and in Michelin, when it rates people, it rates them from the, hello, thank you for calling Meadowood, can I help you? <laughs> um, which wasn't my job, but could be. Uh, uh, and, and two, like, they actually, they iron the tables. They have the crews that come in, and it's not just like, yeah, I'm a waiter, I'm going to show up at 5, I start at 5.30. No, you will be there early, you will talk with the chef, you will understand these ingredients, you will understand, on a molecular level, every single thing that is going to be served. When, the, when they come out to you and they wait on you, you feel like they've got all the time in the world. They synchronize plates. No kidding. If you have a table of four, four waiters come out and they, same exact time. It's fascinating to watch. It's a total performance. And it reminded me of a game. When we go into a game, from the second you start that game to the second you leave, it's a fully designed experience that's in my hands, right? Or your hands, whomever's hands. Um, and let me tell you, if you're not familiar with the Michelin star, so it's related to this guy, believe it or not. Um, when Michelin first came out with their guide, uh, people were traveling all over the place. You know, they've got these tires and we want to encourage them to travel and we're tread off their tires. So, um, so they created these things and they would put a star next to something that they felt was of particular interest. But that one star eventually became three two stars, obviously, and then three stars, which is as good as it gets. Um, this is exceptional cuisine worthy of a special journey. When they say that, people really do fly from all over the world just to visit a three-star restaurant. It is the state of the art. These are the best in the world. Um, and, and you can see in their food, it's really food is art form. And it's not just, well, that looks pretty, but I bet it tastes like garbage. No, it, it tastes more amazing than anything you've ever had. If you've not been to a Michelin three-star restaurant, just wait. Because if you still enjoy food, it'll make every place else feel terrible. <laughs> um, and I realized, like, you know, I'm looking at this and food is an art form. And they're doing, like, that's, maybe that's a yam. I don't know, but, you know, they're doing things with food that you really just take, elevate. A piece of asparagus, for God's sake. And elevating it to a new level, and I'm thinking, like, these are people who are doing to food what I want to do to games. Some more pictures. Um, yeah, these are little mini works of art when they're, when they're delivered to your tables. This, I mean, this is a restaurant I was unsuccessful in getting into, but I would love to. It's called Alenia. It's in Chicago. Uh, this, this dessert is made on the table in front of you, and people eat the dessert off the table. It's what they're known for. They are, uh, they are one of Chicago's three stars. In the world, there are 103 three-star Michelin chefs right now. Uh, and so what's interesting about this is they're often compared to the Oscars, and that's a really terrible uh, ter thing because they're on loan. Like, you can lose your three stars, right? So just imagine, I don't know, you know, pick anybody, any famous actor you know who just won an Academy Award, and yank it from them the next year because they sucked. 
<laughs> you know, so they're on loan. And so once people get, there's this incredible madness. There's actually a, a movie available. The whole thing is on YouTube called The Madness of Perfection. Um, so The Madness of Perfection talks about the incredible, you know, I need to get the stars, I need to get the stars. And then when they get them, it's much worse because if you lose the stars, what does that say? Right? It's a very public falling. Um, and they're always on loan. And they do translate into tremendous success, financial success. And that's an interesting thing when people start out to say, I want to make a game about money, right? Like I imagine like, imagine the Michelin version of a social game, right? Like, please come in, we have great food. Would you like to have some? Oh, it's going to be 10 cents for the chair. Uh, would you like a fork? Would you like to get up? Do you want to leave? Right? You know, like all kinds of crazy stuff. And so, but I'm, I'm hearing about the design, you know, they're just trying to make something great. And so I wonder how this translates to me. And I, so I start studying it when I get into it. And it so happens that this time, I really start getting into some of the stuff Gordon Ramsay's doing. Now remember, I'm working on Facebook games, so it's pretty fitting, frankly. Um, and so there's Gordon Ramsay. Now Gordon Ramsay holds 14 stars currently. Uh, he has had, at the peak of his career, 15. But this dude's an empire. Like, there's nobody who doesn't know him. And you think about it, it's way easier to get known via games than via food, right? Eat Wellington, you know? It's, it's, and so I have this epiphany while I'm watching Gordon Ramsay. I'm watching him in the kitchen, in Hell's Kitchen, yelling at everybody and saying all of this stuff, right? that we actually had the same job, me and, and Gordon. And basically, he had to get all these people to do what he wanted them to do. Um, because ultimately, if, he, if they fucked up, like they don't necessarily care. It's his name on the line, right? It's, if, if a game comes out and it's really bad, it's, it's Sid Meier's name on the line, it's Will Wright's name on the line, it's Peter Molyneux's name on the line, it's your name on the line if they screw up. And you're thinking about like the people in the kitchen, the people in your team, you've all had the people who like it's the night before a milestone and their biggest crisis is that the office is run out of coffee or something, right? Like they've got all these personal things and that's okay. Maybe they're not as invested as you are, but how could you get these people to be as invested? Um, and that people, you know, thinking about the games that I've worked on, that people don't know the story behind them. They don't know necessarily that I took over for a lead designer who was, you know, kind of broken at the time. They don't know the stories about, you know, some of the, the you know, it's interesting, the guy this morning mentioned, uh, he mentioned E.T. E.T. actually sold through and made money. It was a beautiful, profound work of art in which one man coded a game by himself from scratch in assembly on the 2600 in weeks. Try it, just try it. <laughs> <laughs> try it, and I think he will have a radically different opinion on how it's gonna work um, And anyway, it was mostly, there's a whole story behind that, right? Um, but they'll remember you. It's a the team, right? There's all these people on the team, and they're wondering, you know, they're, you, they're not necessarily invested in what you're doing. Um, they've got other reasons that they're there, largely just wanting a paycheck. And so I'm thinking about these people, like all of the outcomes of the team. It's easy to just blame that guy because he didn't deliver something that's great. But I need to be the person at the pass. You know, when Gordon's at the pass and he's checking every single piece of food, I need to be that invested in my game. If it's my name on the game, I can't expect that everybody's going to want to do some great thing to elevate me, right? I need to actually check every single thing. This is a great line from Gordon Ramsay, control your team and your team controls you. Now control is a harsh word potentially, but if your team's not behind you, if your team's not into your vision, you're not gonna have the game that you want to have. There's no two ways about it. So, so I couldn't quite, quite take Gordon Ramsay straight into the team room because I would have, uh, I would have lost my team and I like it. <laughs> so I had to start thinking about other ways to do it, and that's when I first meet Jiro Ono. Now I never actually met Jiro. Uh, he has a three-star Michelin restaurant, a sushi restaurant in Japan, um, and it's in a subway. There's nothing remarkable about his restaurant, but there's something very remarkable about his food. So, um, how many of you have seen this movie, Jiro Dreams of Sushi? Yeah, so it's, it's one of my favorite movies. I've watched it. I've watched it so many times. I've listened to it more times uh, than I've watched it even. Um, and so it's kind of an interesting movie. So the, the, the um, director of the movie says, here's a story about a person living in his father's shadow while his father, uh, while his father is in a relentless pursuit of perfection. And so it's interesting because I can tell pretty much everything I need to know about a person based on who they think that movie was about. Was it? When I heard that quote, I felt like, what? It wasn't a movie about a son. It was a movie about a guy who was obviously perfect. It was about a guy who was my now spiritual leader, right? It was, it was not a movie about his son. Um, but it was. You know, actually, the director had gone around uh, and he had interviewed a bunch of uh, He'd interviewed a bunch of different chefs, and he was planning to do a movie uh, on many chefs, 
until he ran into this pair and decided, like, no, you know, this, this is really what I want to do. These, these, this, there's enough here for a full story. Um, and so I start, you know, I plan to watch this. I plan to watch the movie. At this point in time, I'm just hearing about it from people on Twitter who are like, oh, you've got to, you've got to watch this movie and hearing other game developers talk about it. Um, and so I sit down to watch it. And if you haven't watched it, I won't ruin it for you, but please do watch it. And when I was finished with the film, this is pretty much how I felt. Um, I felt like I sucked more than I ever thought I'd suck, right? Because I'm thinking about the things that I have done, I'm thinking about the corners that I've cut, I'm thinking about how I sometimes look at games as a product that needs to be delivered rather than something that, is, that I'm gifted to make, that, it, that is a, a work of pure passion for me. Um, and I knew I had so, so far to go. And I wasn't the only one. Like, there's stuff all over online, people who are interested in, in his work. These are the things, I'll just let this play. This is what he says at the beginning of the film. And so for him, he really believed that if you got a gift, it was your responsibility to make, to be as great as you could possibly be. And he was totally devoted to it. I mean, the guy's in his 80s and he's still going, right? And so I, I recognize that somebody felt as great about sushi as I felt about games. So clearly there was one other insane person in the world. Um, and this was gonna be amazing. And, and when I'm thinking about Jiro, right, I'm realizing, you know, I think sometimes we know stuff. Like, like, when I was born, nobody had actually, you know, screw the story about me. My kids, when she was five, and she had these little brothers and sisters, and she took all the pillows off the couch, and she laid them out on the floor, and she made a platformer, right? All the kids had to jump, and you got points based on how many pillows you were able to hit. <laughs> nobody had talked to her about platformer design. Like, how did she know how to do that? Because she's a kid, and because she hadn't been into the real world yet. Kids come into the world the best game designers possible. They already know how to have fun. Nobody had to teach them. Nobody had to deliver lectures on how to have fun. Nobody had to help them unlearn the bullshit producers and PMs tried to tell us. No, they already know how to do it, right? And so Gerald Wright made, rem yeah, made me remember stuff. So this is me, I'm oh, so cute. Um, and, and so my mom, like, when I was a kid, I loved to play games. Unfortunately, we didn't have any money. So my mother would take me to yard sales where I would buy games and I would get special deals because all parts were there, right? So, so now I've got all these broken games and the only thing I could do was write rules. And so I'm making games. I don't even know why. If somebody, sometimes I will get asked questions about why do you make games? What made you interested in making games? I don't know, birth? Like, I don't remember. I don't remember, like, I don't remember not liking them. I have, I have no recollection of the time in my life where I didn't feel compelled to make a game out of something. Um, and you know, so like I said, you know, I'd have all these pieces and parts and I would make games from them. And, and when I was a kid, I never said, nobody, I don't think any kid, maybe there's one, right, in therapy now, but maybe there's one kid who says something like, you know what I want to do when I grow up? I want to make mediocre games. I want to make games that don't matter. I want to make games that will not be remembered for years to come. No, I want to grow up and make games that were great. I wanted to make games that were fun. I want to make games that all the other kids would come over and want to play. And I didn't want to deal with this garbage, right? I wanted to try out and get greatness. And I wanted to feel like a Michelin-starred chef in my own life, in my own game making. And so I'm really inspired by people like Jiro Ono and these other chefs. Right to him, it's all about elevating the art form, which is what I want to do with games, what I think all of us want to do with games. Like, this is so different. This is so incredibly different than going to E3, where it's about, like, look at all my polygons, and oh my god, I'm louder than you, and boom, 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 right? It's not like that. In any case, it's like, I love hearing in any game when people say stuff like, can you believe they made a game about that? Like, fuck yes. No, I can't. <laughs> fuck yes, right? Like, that's awesome that people do stuff like that. It's pushing the art form, it's elevating, it's showing people what games can really be about. Um, and I, you know, I was talking to Wolfgang Puck, who if you've never met him, he's always at his restaurant, Spago, and he's very easy to talk to, and, and we'll spend quite a bit of time talking with you. And for him, when I asked him about wanting to be great, he says he never, he never tried to be great. He's, Wolfgang has, uh, Spago has two stars. Um, and for him, he says it's all about the idea and having the ability to execute. And for him, if you say, like he just did a massive renovation on his restaurant, and he will say to people, and people say, well, why are you changing this? People love Spago, you're nuts, you've got two Michelin stars. And he says to not change is the risk. To not do new things is the risk. If he does not change, he will die. He will go out of business. Um, and I think about all the great games, right? Were they, these are the games that did it first or did it better and did it extremely well. They're the games that we're going to remember forever. 
Um, and he always starts with great ingredients, right? He inspects everything. Like, I don't have, I'm not asking for a show of hands, so don't give them to me. Well, I know we've all made a hiring decision that we regret. <laughs> I know we probably all had somebody on our team that we wished would not show up for work one day, right? Um, and every single ingredient, all the tools that we use, everything, these things are critically important. And for him, it's the best tools. Well, for him, yeah, it is the best tools. But for us, it's the best people, the best tools, the best environments, and the best machines. Actually caring about stuff, giving ourselves the best possible platform on which to build something great. Mediocrity rarely rises. Uh, or, right, yeah, I'll stick with that statement. Greatness rarely re rises from mediocrity. Um, and something else I've learned over time, like you will spend so much time managing your failures. The success is great because you just know there's a guy that we work with, um, you know, Chris Burke, I know he's just coding right now. I don't even know what he's coding, I don't even care, but I know he's coding the right stuff. I know he's doing exactly what needs to be done because he's been doing it for 40 years and he wouldn't do anything else but the absolute peak of his ability. Um, and I never have to worry about him. But failures, you have to worry about them every single day. Uh, your responsibility, uh, when I think about being in there and, cre and creating an environment that can create greatness, it's really important. Like, has anybody, like, do you, do you say to the team, like, I want to make something that's great? Can we all get together and really try to make something that's great? Are you not motivated? Why? Um, and really caring, and so that people know uh, what it is you're trying to do, what it is you're trying to reach for, that you're not just trying to make money, that you are, in fact, trying to change things. And Gordon Ramsay, another quote from Gordon Ramsay is, my kitchen, my rules, my standards. And again, if, if you think about it in his voice, you know, maybe it comes across a little harshly, but if you don't tell people what's expected of you, if I don't tell people what's expected of them, uh, it's not surprising if they don't hit those things. Um, I find, uh, and this may not be true of other people, but I do find that sometimes the message is obvious, my rules, my standards, my kitchen. And that could mean that you're not hitting my standards, you're not doing well enough, you're not up to where I want you to be. And I found a few years ago, I actually had to get past, like, well, I want to be liked, and if I tell them that I don't think their stuff is good, and I don't think their stuff is up to par, I, how will they feel about me? Well, that doesn't ship on the back of the box. Game is subpar because she was afraid to tell people what she really thought, so cut her some slack, right? Nobody, no, it doesn't fucking happen, right? Um, and so, so much we try not to be animated isn't gonna happen. Um, and so I had to learn that, right? Like, and there's a good way. There's a non-Gordon Ramsay way to deliver criticism. Um, and responsibility is ever watchful. Uh, always making sure that you are involved with your team in every single thing that they are doing. But one place I really felt that these guys had an edge on me is that they are shipping every single night. Every night they go from beginning to close. Sometimes they're doing two or three seatings, right? In my career, in most game developers' career, we might ship 10. Now, how, how good are you gonna get when that's your full cycle? 10 games. Um, and, and, and the other thing too, like we, we tend to put hacks in, like we're gonna come back and fix that later, which is of course the great king that fly, right? Like, like with this extra month the publisher gives us a beta, right? Like, what does that ever happen? It doesn't happen, right? Um, so I, I really started thinking about putting into my work, polishing constantly, making sure that I was always ready to ship. Whatever I had, it was ready to go and it was in pristine condition, because garbage layers on top of garbage. And then the rule that Michelin chefs use, taste everything. You hear Gordon Ramsay yelling it regularly, like, is anyone playing your game? Are the team members playing your game? Are you having to stop people from playing your game? Because it could be a big indication if they're not, right? Like, if your own team doesn't want your shit, people are obviously not gonna want it in the world either. And then it's a question of consistency. So his son says, the techniques we use are really no big secret. It comes down to making an effort and repeating the same thing every day. So doing what you do well, and for me in game development, that means playing the game and always trying to make it as good as it can possibly be. In a plate in the game, I'm trying to compare these things, and I'm thinking, really, it's a consistent experience. Like, how are you gonna do that in game to game? Well, we're hoping to iterate, right? Like, we're hoping to go further. But it's really the ideals, making sure that moment to moment, session to session, level to level, people are having an experience that they like, that there's not a drop off. Like, well, you know, level five sucked, right? But that's okay. Or I even hear people say things like, well, you know, they'll buy it, because they'll buy anything. You know, is it the whole sea of 43-year-old Facebook moms are a bunch of fucking idiots that want shit because they're not, and that's why they're not playing it anymore. You know, that's just bullshit, trying to make a good game for them. Um, and it's also about simplicity. You know, this is, a, this is Jiro's restaurant. There's nothing about this that's breathtaking and beautiful, a pretty design. Ultimately, you can put any kind of box you want on a bad game, or any kind of box you want on a good game. Um, and if the game is great, if you're do making something as pure and as good as you can possibly be, people will come. Um, I find that, that uh, junior game designers, uh, and sometimes senior game designers, 
often want to just add stuff and complicate things instead of making it just beautiful and simple, like, like Super Hexagon, right? That's a classic game. I love Super Hexagon, and Super Hexagon is just, I suck at it. Um, but, uh, but I love it because it's just simple. It does one thing, it does one thing extremely well. What is the one thing this game is about? It's sticking to it. And then many of you probably heard about the 10,000 hours, that if you do something for 10,000 hours, you will be absolutely great at it. 10,000 hours takes a long time. I was lucky because I got started when I was 15, and if we count the board games that I made and the role master thing that I rewrote when I was 14, I've had my 10,000 hours for quite some time. Um, but the rest, you know, getting those 10,000 hours, the quality of those things, some people are born with natural talent, uh, and others are not. So this is, a, this is a chart of three people I know. We all had talent, and we all got started at the same time. We all got started around 1981. I've made 44 games. My friend, also in 1980, started in 81, has made 20, still in the industry. And the other friend of mine has made 140. And you can tell who's worked more, who's basically sacrificed a ton. And I know this isn't for everybody. Like, I, I get the whole quality of life thing. Um, and I get that people need space and time for their life because, well, life is important. It is what fuels what our games are about. But it's obvious to me when I look at this why the person with 140 games is a better game designer than me because that person has dedicated their life to it. They put in more hours, it's hard work. Um, so hard work is a shortcut to greatness. And then mentorship. So I love in this film, this is a senior apprentice. They actually have levels of apprentice. I'm not even sure that that's a word, right? But in our industry, I don't know that we've actually got a culture of learning. Like, can you say I studied under so-and-so? I don't know many people who can actually say that. I don't know many people who take on apprentices. Um, and his son says, you know, always look above and beyond yourself. Always try to improve yourself. Always survive, strive to elevate your craft. This is what he taught me. And so when I worked on Wizardry, going way back in the 81, when I was working on Wizardry 1, like I was lucky I got to work with these great guys in the industry. And then David Bradley, who I consider my mentor, I got to work with him on Wizardry 7, or 6 and 7. Um, but nobody ever said to me, hey kid, come here, let me show you a recipe for combat. Let me show you how to do this. I had to figure it all out. And it would be so much better if we actually took that responsibility on and taught people. Because it is our responsibility to teach. This is our medium. And part of pushing the art form forward is teaching those who want to learn. And then madness, because there is madness in this. So I have Seinfeld up here because he did what we all should probably do. We should all probably just, just bow out. Like, I've made a great show, everybody loves me, peace, drop the mic, and you're gone, right? Uh, that's probably what we should do, but no, because we're fucking stupid, we keep making games, right? We can make a great game, and I know so many people. I married somebody who, who had Doom, Quake, wait, Wolfenstein, Doom, Quake, and then Die Katana, and then the ad, right? Like, you, you can only follow up those three with something even greater. You know, add aside, right? Like, and I know of other game developers right now who are working on their who are working on their next game, and their previous game is considered to be a masterpiece, and they're fucking terrified because they're worried the internet is going to eat them apart. So we keep going despite the risks because we have to make games. Okay, that's me. Um, so I love this guy again. Like I said, he's 80, um, and he's in he's in his 80s. Uh, and he says, even at my age and my work, I haven't reached perfection. I'll continue to climb, trying to reach the top, but no one knows where the top is, least of all me. And so this does, in fact, bring me back to me. Uh, and that's me uh, in this brownie 2, 223. <laughs> there I am with all my buddies. Um, and this brings me back to me and this kid who would go to yard sales. And at this point in time, I'm going to yard sales and I'm making games, and my friends already think I'm weird. Um, and so I'm making these things, and, and I know that you're here, and you're listening to me, right? So you're also there. I mean, maybe you weren't in a brownie troop, maybe you were wherever the hell you were, but you were that little kid who wanted to grow up and make great games. And you know, that kid who's inside all of us, who didn't want to work on something that was subpar, who didn't want to work on something that was mediocre, who wanted people to point to something and say, I made that, and feel good about it, and feel like they had actually contributed to this form, this medium that has given them so much joy. Um, and I have a responsibility. Like, I look at this kid and she looks like a tool. Her face is like a side. And I hate my haircut. But I have a responsibility to that kid because it was, it was her. It was her who at the age of 15 believed somehow, totally unaware of the game industry, this is 81, that I could make a living off of this. It was this kid that went to yard sales and said, yes, that's a broken game. I'll take it, please. <laughs> it was this kid that, that had $5 of, of, um, of allowance money and dumped it in Pac-Man in like seconds, I feel like. I went out and got a mowing job. I actually had a lawn mowing empire. I would get a bunch of jobs and <laughs> friends to do them so I could have more money to play Pac-Man. Right? <laughs> uh, I mean, it was this kid and it's that kid, even though 
know she, you know, this is many, many years ago, but it's that kid that I have to work so hard for and not cut fucking corners and not compromise and not force decisions and not make bad calls and to be as good as I can possibly be to elevate the art form because it is my responsibility. We have to be great. We have to try to be great. We might fucking miss it. We might miss it by a long shot, but at least we know that we actually tried. Thank you.